Hi all, welcome and welcome back to my channel. I hope you're having a great day. And if you're seeing all of the commotion that's going on online in the Johnny Depp Amber Heard case that is still carrying on, then you know that there have been some post-trial motions that have been filed, starting with Amber Heard's team filing a 42-page motion and Johnny's team responding. And today, the judge made a decision and filed it. So now we have the whole story. And if you're anything like me and roughly knew what was going on but didn't have time to sit down and read the motions, you're not alone. I'm going to do it today. I'm going to read them right here. And we'll all know what was in all of those motions and what the judge told Amber Heard and her team that uh, they wasted their time doing and nice try. So grab yourself a mega pint, sit back, relax, and let's get started. Okay, we're going to start with Amber's motion that was filed first. It was filed on July 1st of 2022, and her complaints were the following. One, the damages awarded by the jury are unsupported by the evidence and the law. Two, the verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are inconsistent and therefore should be set aside. Three, the First Amendment bars recovery for defamation by implication when the statements at issue are true on their face and involve a public figure or matters of public concern. And four, the jury's finding of defamation by implication with respect to the op-ed headline statement is contrary to the law and unsupported by the facts. Now, there was a fifth complaint, and that was about a juror who filed and did not put or put their birth date on the juror form, and it was incorrect, I guess, Amber's team was saying. Uh, that says uh, here on the paperwork for the motion, it says the court should conduct an investigation on juror number 15 and whether jury service was proper and due process and it was protected. So all of these things are going to be covered in this motion, and I am going to start reading it for you so we have an idea of what all this commotion is all about. Now, we start out with Defendant and Counterclaim Plaintiff Amber Heard's post-trial motions. Defendant and Counterclaim Plaintiff Amber Laura Heard hereby moves this court to set aside the jury's verdict on all three counts of Plaintiff and Counterclaim Defendant Johnny C. Depp II's Mr. Depp's complaint to dismiss the complaint and to investigate potential improper juror service. The grounds for this motion are set forth in the accompanying memorandum dated July 1st of 2022. Now we move on to page one. Defendant and counterclaim plaintiff Amber Laura Heard respectfully moves this court to set aside the jury's verdict on all three counts of plaintiff and counterclaim defendant Johnny C. Depp's complaint, dismiss the complaint, alternatively to order a new trial, and to investigate potential improper juror service. In support, Ms. Heard relies upon the prior record, including objections and arguments during hearings and at trial, motions in limine, motions to strike, and the arguments following. Summary of Argument from the beginning, Mr. Depp set out to try this case as a domestic relations dispute he wished he had tried rather than settled in 2016. Mr. Depp's counsel argued throughout the trial that the issues before the jury began six years ago when Ms. Hurd obtained a domestic violence temporary restraining order against Mr. Depp on May 27, 2016. Mr. Depp and his legal team told the jury they were seeking to restore Mr. Depp's reputation and his legacy for his children that this was the first time Mr. Depp had been able to tell his story since Ms. Heard obtained the DVTRO in 2016. The claims in this case were far different than the case Mr. Depp tried to the jury. Mr. Depp's claims arose from an op-ed published in the Washington Post on December 18th of 2018, two and one-half years later. Mr. Depp alleged that three statements, one, the title authored by the Washington Post, formed the basis of his defamation claims. 
To avoid explaining to the jury the UK final judgment finding Mr. Depp to have committed 12 acts of domestic violence, including sexual violence, Defense Exhibit 133, Mr. Depp represented to the court he would limit his damage claims to the period of December 18th of 2018 through November 2nd of 2020, the date of the UK judgment. Yet, Mr. Depp made no such effort at any point in the trial to so limit his claimed damages. Instead, throughout even the closings, Mr. Depp continued to urge the jury to restore his reputation and legacy to his children as a result of Ms. Heard accusing Mr. Depp in May 2016 of domestic violence and obtaining a DVTRO. The jury's verdict was obviously influenced by Mr. Depp's pleas in the face of the court's preclusion of Ms. Heard from introducing evidence that Mr. Depp had already, in fact, been adjudicated in a court of his choosing to have committed not just one act of domestic abuse, all that was needed in this case for a defense verdict, but twelve acts of domestic violence, including sexual violence. The exclusion of the UK judgment complied with Mr. Depp's continuous urging to the jury to go back six years and exonerate him and restore his reputation, resulted in an indefensible $10 million compensatory damage verdict and $5 million punitive damage verdict. The verdict is excessive as a matter of law in light of the evidence and law and should be set aside. Further evidencing the confusion resulting from Mr. Depp's efforts to relitigate the 2016 domestic relations matter without the truth of the UK judgment, the jury's dueling verdicts are inconsistent and irreconcilable. The finding of defamation against Ms. Heard with a $2 million award is inconsistent with the finding of defamation against Mr. Depp with a $15 million award. In the face of these inconsistent verdicts, the judgment should be set aside and a new trial ordered. At trial, Mr. Depp proceeded solely on a defamation by implication theory, abandoning any claims that Ms. Heard's statements were actually false. But where, as here, a. the statements are true on their face, which Mr. Depp never challenged, b. the plaintiff is a public figure, which Mr. Depp has conceded he is, and c. the subject matter of the op-ed is on matters of public concern, which this court earlier determined as a matter of law, the First Amendment prohibits claims by implication. While this appears to be a case of first impression in Virginia, dicta in our courts and holdings in other courts in similar circumstances warrant applying this doctrine to this case, setting aside the judgment and dismissing the complaint. Mr. Depp never challenged the fact that Ms. Heard did not write the title of the op-ed, one of three of the defamatory statements comprising Mr. Depp's defamation claims. Instead, Mr. Depp contended Ms. Hurd's tweet of a link to the article the following day continued actionable replication. Mr. Depp never challenged the fact that Ms. Hurd did not write the title of the op-ed, one of three of the defamatory statements comprising Mr. Depp's defamation claims. Instead, Mr. Depp contended Ms. Hurd's tweet of a link to the article the following day continued actionable republication. In addition to establishing dangerous precedents, suggesting anyone tweeting or retweeting an article or link can be independently liable for the content, this interpretation is beyond the reach of Virginia law on republication. Because nothing in Ms. Hurd's tweet constituted a legally enforceable republication, this count should be dismissed. Since the damages award does not separate out the three separate statements in the event the court does not dismiss all three counts, the judgment should be set aside and a new trial ordered on the remaining claims. For the jury to find Ms. Heard demonstrated actual malice, Mr. Depp was required to establish at the time the op-ed was published, Ms. Heard did not believe she had been abused or that she had doubts about whether she was abused. But Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard did not believe she was abused. Instead, the evidence overwhelmingly supported Ms. Heard believed she was the victim of abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. Therefore, Mr. Depp did not meet the legal requirements for actual malice, and the verdict should be set aside. Next, Mr. Depp improperly relied on time-barred and judicially privileged statements as for the basis for his defamation by innuendo claims. 
although actionable innuendo must be drawn from the four corners of the document, in this case, it could only be drawn from the reference in the article to Ms. Hurd obtaining a DVTRO against Mr. Depp in 2016. This warrants setting aside the verdict on all three of the defamation counts. Finally, the information on the jury panel list appears to be inconsistent with the identity and demographics of one of the jurors. Juror number 15 was apparently born in 1970, not 1945, as reported to and relied upon by the parties, including Ms. Hurd, in selecting a jury panel. Given the requirements for verification of each juror, it appears the identity of the juror was not verified. It is unclear if juror number 15 was, in fact, ever summoned for jury duty or qualified to serve on the panel. This warrants an investigation by this court to determine if the juror was in fact summoned and whether the due process rights of the parties were bypassed. Depending upon the results of the investigation, this may justify setting aside the verdict in its entirety and setting this matter for a new trial. Now we go into the actual argument. 1. The damages awarded by the jury are unsupported by the evidence and the law. The jury returned a verdict in the amount of $10 million in compensatory damages and $5 million in punitive damages. The punitive damages amount was reduced to the statutory cap of $350,000 pursuant to Virginia Code 8.01 to 38.1. These damage awards were unsupported by the evidence presented at trial and cannot be upheld as a matter of law. Under Virginia Code, where damages awarded are too small or too excessive, courts have the authority to order a new trial on all issues or solely on the issue of damages or remediator. While as a general rule, a trial should not disturb a jury award that has been fairly rendered and based upon competent evidence, courts have a duty to correct a verdict that plainly appears to be unfair or would result in a miscarriage of justice and then they cite a few cases. Circumstances which compel setting aside a jury verdict include a damage award that is so excessive that it shocks the conscience of the court, creating the impression that the jury was influenced by passion, corruption, or prejudice, that the jury has misconceived or misunderstood the facts of the law, or the award is so out of proportion to the injuries suffered as to suggest that it is not the product of a fair and impartial decision. Setting aside a verdict as excessive, under these conditions, is an exercise of the inherent discretion of the trial court. Here, the jury's determination of $10 million in compensatory damages is excessive as matter of law, as there is no evidence to support the verdict. Mr. Depp was limited to damages from December 18, 2018, the date of Ms. Hurd's op-ed, through November 2, of 2020 the date the court ruled in the United Kingdom that Mr. Depp had committed at least 12 acts of domestic violence, including sexual violence, at times causing Ms. Hurd to fear for her life. The court during opening statements in response to Mr. Depp's objection prohibited Ms. Hurd from telling the jury about the Sun article, which was published on April of 2018. Defense Exhibit 99, nearly eight months before the op-ed, the trial in July 2020, during the limited period Mr. Depp was able to claim damages, the complaint filed by Mr. Depp in June 2018, alleging rep irreparable damage to his reputation, Defense Exhibit 1599. The three-week trial on Mr. Depp's libel claims, the ensuing publicity surrounding the trial, or the UK judgment, a 129-page, 585-paragraph document issued on November 2, 2020, Defense Exhibit 133. After many of Mr. Depp's witnesses had testified, the court then allowed Ms. Hurd to raise but not admit into evidence the Sun article, the fact of the trial, and the publicity surrounding the trial, but still not the UK judgment. In an effort to prevent the UK judgment from coming into evidence, Mr. Depp represented he would not attempt to claim any damages after November 2nd of 2020, this coming from the April 29, 2022 hearing. Notwithstanding Mr. Depp's representation, he would not attempt to claim any damages other than during the period December 18th of 2018 through November 2nd of 2020, 
Mr. Depp made no attempt to limit his damages, and his counsel in closings made clear they were seeking damages from May 27th of 2016, the date Ms. Heard sought to and obtained the DVTRO, through the present. This was highly prejudicial to Ms. Heard, necessarily created confusion for the jury, and resulting in $10 million compensatory and $5 million punitive awards reflect the jury's belief that it was restoring Mr. Depp's reputation based on Ms. Hurd's initial filing of the May 2016 DVTRO, as Mr. Depp's counsel requested in openings and closings. This alone justifies setting aside the verdict and ordering a new trial. Mr. Depp presented no evidence of any pecuniary damages suffered in the limited December 18, 2018 through November 2, 2020 timeframe as a result of the op-ed. There was no evidence of any projects or lost commercial opportunities because of the op-ed. Moreover, Mr. Depp cannot demonstrate any reputational damages from the op-ed because the evidence, including Mr. Depp's own testimony, was that Mr. Depp lost nothing less than everything. As of May 27, 2016, when Ms. Hurd obtained the DVTRO against him, and then there were two years of just constant worldwide talk about Mr. Depp being this wife-beater, before the op-ed was even published, including the Sun wife-beater article. In addition, any reputational damage after the op-ed, which never mentioned Mr. Depp's name, would have been non-existent or at least, or at best, nominal, compared to the Sun article, the lawsuit brought by Mr. Depp, the publicity over Mr. Depp's lawsuit against the Sun in the United Kingdom, the subsequent trial, and the judgment rendered against Mr. Depp. Now, there's a footnote. I'm just going to read that. In spite of Mr. Depp's representations that it would, he would not seek to introduce or claim any damages to Mr. Depp after November 2, 2020, Ms. Hurd never agreed that limiting Mr. Depp's damages would obviate the need for the UK decision to be referenced and admitted into trial, and instead repeatedly requested the court to reconsider and admit the UK judgment into trial. That's the end of the footnote. Now, back to the argument. And just so you know, and please excuse, there are a lot of typos in here, and the referring to Johnny Depp is it, and I am trying to correct it as I'm reading, so please forgive me if I have to repeat myself. All right, back to it. Moreover, the exclusion of the UK judgment necessarily prevents any reasonable or competent assessment of any damages, including reputational damages, as well as the credibility of Mr. Depp in asserting damages. There is no way a jury can determine any level of damage to Mr. Depp from the op-ed without taking into consideration all potential alternative causes of damages, much less such an overriding one brought on at Mr. Depp's election to file a libel suit in a forum of his choosing, claiming irreparable damages to his reputation from the Sun article. There can be no damages reasonably tied to the op-ed, much less $10 million. It is excessive as a matter of law and should be set aside. A. There is no evidence of pecuniary damages from the op-ed. Taking the evidence in light most favorable to Mr. Depp, there is no evidence upon which the jury could have reasonably relied to determine that Mr. Depp suffered any pecuniary loss because of the op-ed. While Mr. Depp asserted the loss Pirate 6, that he lost Pirate 6 because of the op-ed, there is no evidence upon which the jury could rely to reach such a conclusion. Mr. Depp did not have a contract for Pirate 6, there was media coverage that Mr. Depp would not be in Pirate 6 as of October 25th of 2018, two months before the op-ed. Mr. Depp's agent testified that it was very likely Mr. Depp would not be in Pirate 6 as of the fall of 2018, and Mr. Depp testified that he would not have agreed to play a role in Pirate 6 for $300 million and a million alpacas. Moreover, the Disney corporate representative testified that Pirate 6 is still a project that's possibly in development at the studio as of present, and that Disney would not entertain paying Mr. Depp $300 million and provide him with a million alpacas. I love that. And Disney's representative further testified she did not know if Pirate 6 would ever be made. 
While Mr. Depp's agent testified to a deal for Mr. Depp for Pirate 6 for $22.5 million, yet also admitting that there's no writing memorializing the supposed deal, he said that Mr. Depp would not be paid until the film shoots. Mr. Wingen's belief there existed a contract was based on his understanding that Tracy Jacobs, Mr. Depp's earlier agent, had negotiated a deal. However, Tracy Jacobs testified there was no deal negotiated and no commitment from Disney that Mr. Depp would be in Pirate 6 while she represented Mr. Depp, which was up until October of 2016. Since the film has never been shot, let alone even written, and was not by November the 2nd of 2020, the date Mr. Depp's damages are cut off, it would be impossible for Mr. Depp to claim damages for Pirate 6. Yet, Mr. Depp continued to claim this at trial. Most importantly, there is no evidence that the op-ed op has had anything to do with whether Mr. Depp will be in Pirate 6. The Disney corporate representative testified that no decision-maker within Disney has ever said that Disney would not catch Mr. Depp in Pirate 6 or any other Disney project because of Ms. Hurd's op-ed. In fact, while Disney had internal emails commenting on negative publicity relating to Mr. Depp, including the UK trial and judgment, it had nothing in its files even referring to the op-ed, much less a copy of the op-ed. Even Mr. Marks, Mr. Depp's expert, acknowledged the article published three days after the UK judgment, indicating that Mr. Depp was out of any further Pirates franchise. If the jury based any aspect of its award on Pirates 6, this would have been contrary to the evidence, pre prejudicially impacted by Ms. Hurd, being prevented from introducing the November 2, 2020 UK Judgment, Defense Exhibit 133, or the article three days later, Defense Exhibit 134, purely speculative and was effectively prohibited because Mr. Depp was limited to damages before November 2, 2020. Nor is there any evidence Mr. Depp lost any other opportunities because of the op-ed. There's no evidence of any other films being lost because of the op-ed. Mr. Wiggum testified that Mr. Depp did not have any studio films between December 2018 and October 2020, but he did not testify that it was the op-ed that caused Mr. Depp to lose any opportunities. Instead, Mr. Carino, Mr. Depp's other agent, testified that the publicity surrounding litigation was harmful to Mr. Depp's career. Mr. Depp filed the lawsuit against The Sun and Mr. Woolen in June of 2018 and against Ms. Hurd in March of 2019. Mr. Wiggum testified there was a great deal of publicity surrounding the UK trial, and Mr. Depp had not been cast in any film since the UK trial. There is also no evidence of any endorsements Mr. Depp lost or did not receive because of the op-ed. In fact, Mr. Depp still has an endorsement deal with Dior, which he has had since 2015. There is absolutely no evidence demonstrating the op-ed caused Mr. Depp to suffer any financial losses, and Mr. Depp did not testify to any loss opportunities or financial damages. B. The jury's compensatory and punitive damage awards were excessive as a matter of law. Given that the jury did not, and could not, award Mr. Depp damages for any financial or pecuniary losses based on the evidence presented at trial, the only damages the jury could have possibly awarded Mr. Depp were reputational damages. Even though reputational damages are non-pecuniary, a jury still must award damages that resulted only from the defendant's wrong and not from other causes. There's another footnote that reads, At no point in his testimony or through his experts did Mr. Depp ever claim damages for emotional distress. Moreover, reputational damages cannot be used to punish a defendant for all of the negative publicity that plaintiff had received, separate from the alleged defamation. But this is precisely what happened here, and it was compounded by the exclusion of evidence of the UK judgment. C. Mr. Depp is not entitled to damages for any conduct prior to the op-ed. There is no evidence of damage to Mr. Depp's reputation caused by Ms. Hurd's op-ed. Instead, Mr. Depp testified that the damage to his reputation was when Ms. Hurd obtained the DVTRO on May 27th of 2016, for which he cannot be compensated. 
Mr. Depp began his testimony by informing the jury that he had brought this case because, quote, about six years ago, Ms. Hurd made some quite heinous and disturbing, brought these certain criminal acts against me that, that were not based in any species of truth, unquote. Mr. Depp then continued his testimony by describing how the accusations from the DVTRO in 2016 spread through the media. Quote, the news of this, her accusations had sort of permeated the industry and then made its way through media and social media, became quite global, let's say. Fact, if you will. I felt it my responsibility to stand up, not only for myself in that instance, but stand up for my children, who, at the time, were 14 and 16, and so they were in high school, and I thought it was diabolical that my children would have to go to school and have their friends or people in the school approach them with the infamous People magazine cover, with Miss Heard with a dark bruise on her face. And then it just kept, the, uh, it kept multiplying. It just kept getting bigger and bigger, unquote. Mr. Depp emphasized that his reputation had been damaged for six years, well before Ms. Hurd's op-ed. So it was my responsibility, oh, I apologize, quote, so it was my responsibility I felt to not only attempt to clear my name for the sake of, well, for many reasons, but I wanted to clear my children of this hard thing that they were having to read about their father, which was untrue. It has really taken this full six years and it's been six years of trying times. It's very strange when one day you're Cinderella, so to speak, and in 0 0.6 seconds you're Quasimodo. Unquote. Mr. Depp's testimony clearly establishes that the damage to his reputation occurred in May 2016 and was not related to the op-ed. And this was not isolated evidence. Mr. Depp also testified that the public became aware of the DVTRO in May of 2016. The bad news about him, quote, was multiplying and multiplying and multiplying throughout the media, throughout social media as well, so-called sort of strike media or whatever, and I was taken aback a bit. They were abuse allegations, and then there was alcohol, and then there was drugs and violence. And it just, it was already right then there, before my eyes, spinning out of control, unquote. Mr. Depp testified that when Ms. Hurd obtained the DVTRO, he lost nothing less than everything. Quote, Because when the allegations were made, when the allegations were rapidly circling the globe, telling people I was a drunken, cocaine-fueled menace who beat women, suddenly in my fifties, it's over. You know, you're done. Unquote. This negative publicity in 2016 included articles from TMZ and People magazine, that showed photos of the abuse, of the abuse alleged by Ms. Hurd, which Mr. Depp introduced into evidence in this case. The negative publicity about Mr. Depp before Ms. Hurd's op-ed also included headlines such as, "Apparently drunk Johnny Depp cut off at Hollywood Film Awards ceremony." Johnny Depp, friends and family seriously concerned about him. Here's why. Johnny Depp has a clear and epic sense of entitlement. Ex-managers say. Johnny Depp, a star in crisis and the insane story of his missing millions. Johnny Depp reportedly drunk heavily and was constantly late on the new Pirates movie set. Johnny Depp's financial woes might sink the next Pirates of the Caribbean. Where did it all go wrong for Johnny Depp? After a string of flops and a ton of bad press, Johnny Depp's star power looks as wobbly as Jack Sparrow on a plank. Pirates of the Caribbean? The Diminishing Returns of Johnny Depp? Why are all of Johnny Depp's movies bombing at the box office? Johnny Depp allegedly showed up drunk to movie premiere, reports say. The real reason Johnny Depp used an earpiece on film set. The trouble with Johnny Depp, multi-million dollar lawsuits, a haze of booze and hash, a marriage gone very wrong, and a lifestyle he can't afford inside the trials of Johnny Depp. Vodka for breakfast? 72-hour drug binges and spending sprees, that beggar belief. Ellison Boshoff reveals why Hollywood's revealing, Hollywood's reeling, over what's being called Johnny Depp's career suicide note. How can J.K. Rowling be genuinely happy casting wife-beater Johnny Depp in the new Fantastic Beasts film? 
Mr. Depp admitted that these articles were not because of Ms. Hurd's op-ed. They could not have been. But rather, quote, all started with Ms. Hurd going to, going directly to a court to get a TRO, which is with a bruise on her face and paparazzi. That was the sort of the beginning of the ball rolling down the hill and gaining momentum, unquote. After six weeks of trial, Mr. Depp went back up to the stand and reiterated his testimony to the jury, stating that Ms. Hurd's actions on May 27, 2016, changed everything. He again did not state that it was the op-ed that damaged him, but the accusations from May 2016, claiming that, quote, I have spoken up for what I have been carrying on my back reluctantly for six years, unquote. Mr. Depp did not only rely on his own testimony to claim damages from May 2016 forward. Doug Banya, an expert hired by Mr. Depp, was, quote, asked to analyze the impact of the, this, the allegations of domestic abuse made by Ms. Hurd as it relates to her 2016 restraining order, and then asked also to analyze the publication of that alleged abuse in her 2018 Washington Post op-ed, unquote. Mr. Banya testified that his, quote, analysis shows that prior to 2016 and the allegations, the abuse allegations, Mr. Depp was not portrayed in a negative connotation. Then, after the 2016 mark, you know, the majority of those results turned into negative things about the abuse allegations. And then, even more so after the op-ed, there seemed to be a kind of theme or a flavor of not only the abuse allegations, but his drinking and drug use. Unquote. But Mr. Banya admitted that his analysis cannot, again, quote, separate out how Mr. Depp's reputation was impacted by the op ed versus how it was impacted by when Ms. Hurd filed for divorce. Unquote. This means, as Mr. Banya admitted, that Mr. Depp's expert cannot say that Mr. Depp's reputation or public image was affected by the op ed. In fact, Mr. Banya testified that Mr. Depp's Q scores, both positive and negative, actually improved after Ms. Hurd's op-ed, meaning his reputation and public image actually improved after the op-ed into 2020, which again Mr. Banya admitted. Finally, Mr. Depp's counsel improperly emphasized to the jury that it could find damages based on Ms. Hurd obtaining the DFEED TRO. Counsel began Mr. Depp's closing argument not by discussing the op-ed, but by stating, quote, On May 27th of 2016, Ms. Hurd walked into a courthouse in Los Angeles, California to get a no-notice ex parte restraining order against Mr. Depp, and in doing so, ruined his life by falsely telling the world that she was a survivor of domestic abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp. Today, on May 27th of 2022, exactly six years later, we ask you to give Mr. Depp his life back by telling the world that Mr. Depp is not the abuser Ms. Hurd says she is, that he is, and hold Ms. Hurd accountable for her lies, unquote. Counsel for Mr. Depp then went on to tell the jury that Ms. Hurd seeking the DVTRO was not based on truth and was instead designed to ruin Mr. Depp, quote, when she walked into court six years ago today, on May 27th of 2016, to get a domestic violence restraining order against Mr. Depp, she did so in front of paparazzi with a mark on her face. The evidence presented at this trial demonstrates that Ms. Hurd didn't just want a divorce, she wanted to ruin him. Unquote. Like Mr. Depp's testimony, the evidence offered throughout the case, these were not isolated remarks, but permeated the entire closing that Ms. Hurd should be held responsible for seeking the DVTRO in 2016. Quote, that's when his life ended. That was six years ago to this day, when Ms. Hurd, on May 27th of 2016, walked into court with her public, with her publicist, Jody Gottlieb, having tipped off TMZ with an alleged mark on her face to accuse Mr. Depp of abuse, unquote. Quote, it is about Mr. Depp's reputation and freeing him from the prison in which he has lived for the last six years, and it is six years to the day. You heard from Mr. Depp yesterday that he has been carrying these outlandish, outrageous stories on his back pretty stoic stoically 
and living with them for six years and waiting to be able to bring the truth back. Unquote. The emphasis of this closing was clear. Mr. Depp was asking the jury to compensate him for actions that occurred on May 27th of 2016, actions to which he has no right to damages. This is improper and calls for this court to set aside the verdict. Quote, the court has a substantial concern that the jury's decision was a result of an attempt by them not merely to compensate, but to punish the defendant for her remarks about a personal matter on the public airwaves. Moreover, it appears that they intended to punish her for all of the negative publicity that the plaintiff received and not just the effects of one interview in March of 2016, unquote. D. Mr. Depp is not entitled to damages for alternative causes including the Sun publication, the ensuing litigation brought by Mr. Depp, the UK trial, and surrounding publicity, and the UK judgment. The evidence demonstrates that any damages caused to Mr. Depp after the op-ed were not because of the op-ed. There were a number of alternative casualties, and most significant was surrounding the Sun's April 2018 publication in the UK for an article by Dan Wooten entitled, How Can J.K. Rowling Be Genuinely Happy Casting Wife Beater Johnny Depp in the New Fantastic Beasts Film? And the ensuing lawsuit, trial, and judgment. Mr. Depp brought a lawsuit against The Sun and Mr. Wooten on June 13th of 2018, six months before Ms. Hurd's op-ed, because Mr. Depp wanted to clear his name. The exact same quest repeated by Mr. Depp and his counsel throughout this trial. The UK litigation resulted in a three-week trial in London in the summer of 2020. As Mr. Depp's agent testified, there was an enormous amount of press surrounding the trial. In fact, Mr. Vanya's analysis found that the press surrounding Mr. Depp after Ms. Hurd's op-ed did not mention the op-ed at all, but instead was about Mr. Depp's trial in the UK, which included the following headlines. Johnny Depp's disturbing alleged text messages read out loud in court as libel lawsuit begins. Let's burn Amber. Text allegedly sent by Johnny Depp about X read in court. Hollywood nervously awaits fallout from explosive Johnny Depp trial. Johnny Depp vs. Amber Heard, all the nasty bits of the UK trial, and it's all nasty. Johnny Depp claims the son, in the son, he beat his ex-wife. Complete lies, court told. Mr. Depp's agent testified that after the trial and these headlines in July of 2020, Mr. Depp has made no more films. And there's another footnote. This case is the opposite of government micro... I'm not sure what this is. Government micro RES Incorporated versus Jackson 271 in Virginia, in which the Supreme Court acknowledged Jackson's right to recover greater damages because he presented evidence of his untarnished reputation prior to the defamation. Mr. Depp's reputation... Oh, and then it just ends right there. So carrying on. Mr. Depp cannot, as a matter of law, be compensated for any injuries caused by anything associated with the Sun publication, the UK lawsuit, the trial, or the UK judgment. Yet Mr. Depp's expert, Mr. Banya, could not separate out how Mr. Depp's reputation was impacted from the op-ed versus the publicity surrounding Mr. Depp's UK litigation. Nor did Mr. Depp present any other evidence that was able to separate any damages Mr. Depp purportedly incurred from the op-ed versus what he sustained from the UK litigation. Finally, Mr. Depp claimed in his testimony that he has been damaged for the past six years, including through his jury ver this jury verdict. Mr. Depp's counsel also argued in this closing, quote, You heard from Mr. Depp yesterday that he has been carrying these outlandish, outrageous stories on his back pretty stoically and living with them for six years and waiting to be able to bring the truth back, unquote. This completely defied Mr. Depp's repre representation to the court that Mr. Depp was only going to claim damages from December 18th of 2018 through November 2nd of 2020. It is eminently unfair and prejudicial for the jury to be told repeatedly that Mr. Depp was damaged for six years up to the present 
while Mr. Depp represented to the court that he was not claiming such damages. The prejudice is exponentially increased because Ms. Hurd was denied the ability to introduce the evidence that Mr. Depp's lawsuit against the son and Mr. Wooten resulted in an extensive 129-page judicial finding that Mr. Depp committed 12 acts of domestic violence against Ms. Hurd, including sexual violence, and had caused Ms. Hurd to fear for her life. The jury's verdict as to damages should be set aside. E. Virginia case law supports setting aside damages, judgments that are excessive. There have been several cases that have found damages to be excessive in defamation cases, which are instructive here. While each case must be determined by its own facts, it is nevertheless true that the verdicts of other juries which have been approved by the courts represent the common or average judgment of mankind as to the proper recovery in such cases. Sheckler v. Virginia Broadcorp in Charlottesville. Finding a verdict of $10 million to be excessive and multiple times the amount of any other damages awarded for defamation in Virginia, quoting Chesapeake and Ohio versus Arrington in Virginia, 1919. For example, in Richmond Newspapers, Inc. versus Lipscomb, 234 Virginia, the Virginia Supreme Court sustained a remitter of 900000 from a million-dollar compensatory damage award for defamation arising out of the publication of a front-page article in the Richmond Times-Dispatch, which reported on complaints about plaintiff's performance as a teacher. While the court affirmed the judgment that the teacher was defamed, it held that an award of a million dollars clearly would have been excessive, and that the evidence does not demonstrate that the trial court abused its discretion in reducing the award to $100,000. In Gazette, Inc. v. Harris, 229, Virginia, in 1985, the jury awarded compensatory damages of $100,000 for publication of an advertisement accusing plaintiff of racism in the campus newspaper of the university where plaintiff was a professor. The Virginia Supreme Court held that $100,000 in damages bore no relationship to the loss sustained by the plaintiff. The verdict of $100,000 is so out of proportion to the damage sustained as to be excessive as a matter of law. As defendant pointed out, Moore experienced no physical manifestation of any emotional distress. Moreover, he sought no medical attention for any condition resulting from the publication. In addition, there was no evidence that Moore's standing with his peers was diminished as the result of the libel. Actually, the evidence showed that Moore continues to be held in high esteem among his community of friends and colleagues. Similarly, Mr. Depp can point to no damages sustained from the op-ed as opposed to other unrelated events. The $10 million verdict is completely out of proportion with anything even remotely related to the op-ed, especially in light of the Sun article, the lawsuit filed by Mr. Depp, the ensuing trial, and admitted negative publicity, and the adverse UK judgment in the same time frame. Two circuit court cases are also instructive. In Thomas v. Simas, 101, Virginia, in 2019, the court reduced a damaged award of $350,000 for defamation to $75,000. The court found that the award was excessive because on March 8, 2016, when defendant made her defamatory statement to WAVY-TV, plaintiff had already been unflatteringly portrayed in many articles criticizing him in the Virginia pilot. As described above and admitted to by Mr. Depp, he had been unflatteringly portrayed for at least two years before Ms. Hurd's op-ed. In addition, the court in Thomas had a substantial concern that the jury's decision was the result of an attempt by them not merely to compensate, but to punish defendant for her remarks about a personal matter on the public airwaves. Moreover, it appears that they intended to punish her for all of the negative publicity that the plaintiff had received and not just the effects of one interview in March of 2016. Here, the jury's award of $10 million is not commensurate with damages purportedly caused by Ms. Hurd's op-ed, but rather appear to punish her for all the alleged harm caused to Mr. Depp for the past six years, beginning with the May 27, 2016 DVTRO, 
for which Mr. Depp was not entitled to receive damages. The same is true for the $5 million punitive damages. There was obviously a sense to punish Miss Hurd for something far beyond the op-ed. Finally, in Sheckler v. Virginia Broadcorp, in 2003 in Charlottesville, the court found an award of damages of $10 million in a defamation case to be excessive and reduced the award to $1 million. There, a broadcast corporation through its TV station aired inaccurate information regarding plaintiff's arrest for conspiracy to distribute cocaine, namely that law enforcement officers found 50 grams of crack cocaine and 500 grams of powder cocaine at his residence and business. Despite the finding of defamation, the court significantly reduced the damages award because it found that the defendant could be held responsible only for those injuries inflicted by the defamatory portions of the defendant's broadcasts, not the losses or injuries sustained from the attendant arrest, prosecution, and forfeiture proceedings, or from the newspaper accounts and the accurate proportions and the accurate portions of the television broadcasts and internet publications reporting those events. Likewise, the defendant could not be held liable for creating any of the emotional, mental health, or physical symptoms deemed to have predated the defamatory broadcasts. Notwithstanding these limitations and conditions, the jury awarded the plaintiff $10 million, an amount more than sufficient to com compensate him for all of his injuries from any source whatsoever. The most plausible explanation for the size of the award is that the jury misperceived the law and the instructions, and instead set out to punish the defendant in addition to compensating the plaintiff. The same is true here. Where it appears that the jury was punishing Ms. Hurd for everything that happened to Mr. Depp from 2016 forward. In fact, Mr. Depp's closing asked the jury to clear his name for everything from 2016 forward, which the court on in Sheckler held was in error, holding that the excessive award is supported by a review of plaintiff counsel remarks in summation. Instead of asking for compensation for proven losses, plaintiff's counsel without objection asked the jury to require the defendant television station to pay an enormous sum of money to clear Mr. Sheckler's good name. Mr. Depp's counsel asked the jury to give Mr. Depp his life back by referring not to the op-ed, but by referring back to May 27th of 2016. Quote, On May 27th of 2016, Ms. Hurd walked into a courthouse in Los Angeles, California to get a no notice ex parte restraining order against Mr. Depp and in doing so ruined his life by falsely telling the world that she was a survivor of domestic abuse, abuse at the hands of Mr. Depp, unquote. Damages in this case cannot be based on actions from 2016 or any damages that Mr. Depp suffered because of the trial in the UK. But the jury's $10 million judgment for reputational damages clearly showed that is what the jury did. Such an award is excessive, and by law, should be set aside. 2. The verdicts on the complaint and counterclaim are inconsistent and therefore should be set aside. The Virginia Supreme Court has held that jury verdicts that are irreconcilably inconsistent cannot stand. Roanoke Hospital Association v. Doyle v. Russell, 215 Virginia, in 1975. In that case, the Supreme Court instructed that a new trial is necessary when portions of a jury verdict are irreconcilable. See also Tyree v. Harding, 11 Virginia Circuit, 446 in Lynchburg, 1977, holding that the jury verdict was inconsistent, which, quote, in such form requires a new trial on all issues, unquote. Here, the jury's verdict in favor of Mr. Depp as to his defamation claims and in favor of Ms. Hurd as to her claim of defamation are inherently and irreconcilably inconsistent and therefore cannot stand. The verdicts found that Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Hurd at any time, while at the same time necessarily found that Ms. Hurd did not lie about being a victim of domestic abuse, and in particular abuse that occurred on May 21st of 2016. These findings are nearly inconsistent are entirely inconsistent. In overruling Ms. Hurd's demur, 
This court held that the statements, quote, Amber Heard, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath that has to change, unquote. Then, two years ago, I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, domestic abuse, and I felt the full force of our culture's wrath for women who speak out. And I had the rare vantage point of seeing in real time how institutions protect men accused of abuse. All could convey the same meaning that Mr. Depp abused Ms. Heard. In reaching that conclusion, the court held that the inference could be made based on, quote, the events surrounding the party's divorce, unquote, including the allegations from May 2016. This holding means that for the jury to have found in Mr. Depp's favor as to his defamation claims, it necessarily had to find that Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Heard at any time, including May 21st of 2016. Conversely, when this court overruled Mr. Depp's demur to Ms. Heard's counterclaim, it held that the statement made on April 27th of 2020 about the May 21st, 2016 incident implies that Ms. Heard lied and perjured herself when she appeared before a court in 2016 to obtain a temporary restraining order against Mr. Depp. Moreover, it implies that she lied about being a victim of domestic abuse. This holding means that for the jury to have found in Mr. Hurd's favor, in Ms. Hurd's favor, oh my gosh, there's so many typos in here, as to her defamation claim, it necessarily had to find that Ms. Hurd did not lie about being a victim of domestic abuse and in particular the incident occurring on May 21st of 2016. Mr. Depp himself acknowledged before the trial that the party's defamation claims are mirror images of each other. Quote, this case is unique. It involves two essentially mirror image defamation claims asserted against the only two people who truly know whether the statements at issue are true or false. If Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Heard, she indisputably knows her claim that he did is false. If Mr. Depp did abuse Ms. Heard during their brief marriage, he knows that Mr. Waldman's statements calling Ms. Heard a liar are false. Unquote. There's also another footnote. The full statement here quite simply means this was an ambush, a hoax. They set Mr. Depp up by calling the cops, but the first attempt didn't do the trick. The officers came to the penthouses thoroughly searched and interviewed and left after seeing no damage to face or property. So Amber and her friends spilled a little wine and roughed the place up, got their story straight under the direction of a lawyer and a publicist, and then placed the second not call to 911. That was a quote that they placed, but I'm not sure exactly what they're referring to in that footnote. Okay, continuing on. As Mr. Depp's own brief makes clear, the parties' claims each against each other necessarily imply that Mr. Depp either did or did not abuse Ms. Heard. By finding defamation against both parties, the jury necessarily found both that Mr. Depp did not abuse Ms. Heard and at the same time that Mr. Depp did abuse Ms. Heard. Thus, these verdicts are irreconcilably inconsistent and therefore cannot stand. At a minimum, the jury's finding in favor of Ms. Heard necessarily precludes a finding of actual malice by her with respect to Mr. Depp's claims. 3. The First Amendment bars recovery for defamation by implication when the statements at issue are true on their face and involve a public figure or matters of public concern. The Supreme Court of Virginia has never decided whether facially true statements can support a claim of defamation by implication when they involve a public figure or matters of public concern. In Pendleton v. Newsom, 290 Virginia, in 2015, however, the court signaled that this doctrine does not apply in these circumstances. There, the court distinguished Chapin v. Knight Rider, Inc., 993, circa 1993, where the Fourth Circuit held that the speech at issue did not impart a defamatory implication from the facts of Pendleton reasoning in Chapin, the court considered a libel claim in which the defendants were members of the press, the plaintiffs were public figures, and the subject matter touched on matters of public concern, controversy regarding the involvement of American troops in the Persian Gulf War. Here, by contrast, the plaintiff was not a public figure, the defendants were employed by government agencies, but were not officials generally known, the publicity attending the subject matter lasted only a few days, 
and the freedom of the press is in no way impacted. Pendleton 290, Virginia, reads, This reasoning indicates that defamation by implication warrants different treatment when the speech at issue involves public figures or affairs. It also demonstrates that whether the First Amendment permits recovery in these circumstances is a question of first impression in Virginia. Several jurisdictions have held defamation by implication is not recognized as a viable cause of action when the statements at issue concern public figures or matters of public concern. See Johnson v. Perpera, 320. It regards defamation by implication or innuendo is, quote, actionably only, actionable only if the statements regard a private individual and private affairs, unquote. Okay, they're going on and on and on, quoting cases, quoting cases, quoting cases. I'm going to just bypass some of it because I don't want to put you to sleep. Okay. Other courts permit actions for defamation by implication of a public figure only when the inference arises from the omission of material facts in a challenged communication. And they're quoting other cases. Oh, my gosh. Libel law may not impose damages for injuries to reputation arising from a press report of materially true facts about a public figure on a matter of public interest and without material factual omissions. Similarly, courts that permit public figures to recover for defamation by implication generally define this tort as occurring when a publication, one, juxtaposes a series of facts so as to imply a defamatory, a defamatory connection between them, or two, creates a defamatory implication by omitting facts. The touchstone of implied defamation claims is an artificial juxtaposition of two true statements or the material omission of facts that would render the challenge statements non-defamatory. Three rationales underlying these decisions are instructive. First, precluding liability for facially true statements about public figures or affairs is corollary to the protection of false statements published without malice. Truthful statements which carry a defamatory implication can be actionable. However, it is only true in the case of private citizens and private affairs. Even false statements about public officials are constitutionally protected unless known to be false or printed with a, le a reckless disregard for the truth. That is from the New York Times. Let's see. New York Times versus Sullivan. It surely follows that all truthful statements are also constitutionally protected. Even though a false implication may be drawn by the public, there is no redress for its servant. Where public officers and public affairs are concerned, there can be no libel by innuendo. Okay, now they're going into quoting, citing another case. Let's see. Okay, quote, Just as the goal of a free and active press protects false statements of fact regarding public figures published without malice, so too must the law protect truthful facts that may give rise to false innuendo or inference, unquote. Second, as a result of their fame, public figures enjoy a platform that allows them to reach a broad audience when expressing their viewpoints. Public officials and public figures usually enjoy significantly greater access to the channels of effective communication and hence have a more realistic opportunity to counteract false statements than private individuals normally enjoy. With this benefit comes the risk of closer public scrutiny than might otherwise be the case. Any article replete with snide innuendos can be hurtful to a subject and indeed may damage him and his business reputation. But if he is a public figure, then he must bear the risk of such publicity as the price he pays for conducting activities or business in the public arena. Third, where public affairs are concerned, the publication of true statements is encouraged, and there can be no civil or criminal liability for such, regardless of ill will or improper motive on the part of the speaker. As expressed in the op-ed, the public scorn inflicted upon individuals who report abuse as a matter of, is a matter of great public concern. True statements about this subject should be afforded protection by the First Amendment. Speech about public figures in matters of public concern 
lies at the core of the First Amendment. See New York Times v. Sullivan, 1964. Debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open. Given the First Amendment interests at stake, the reasoning described above, the Court should hold that true statements about public figures or matters of public concern cannot support a claim for defamation by implication. In the alternative, the Court should hold that when such speech is at issue, defamation by implication is permissible only if the defamatory inference arises from the juxtaposition of facts or the omission of material facts in the challenged publication. At trial, Mr. Depp did not prevent present evidence that the statements at issue were untrue on their face. He proceeded exclusively on a theory of defamation by implication. He also did not attempt to prove the alleged implication arose from the juxtaposition of facts or an omission of material facts in the op-ed. There is no dispute Mr. Depp is a public figure. He has expressed, he has expressed admitted he was a public figure and technically conceded this point by tendering jury instructions that required him to prove actual malice. Quote, Those who by reason of the notoriety of their achievements or their vigor and success with which they seek the public's attention are properly classified as public figures. Unquote. Moreover, this court has already ruled that the op-ed addresses matters of public concern. Quote, speech involves matters of public concern when it can be fairly considered as related to any matter of political, social, or other concern to the community, or when it is a subject of legitimate news interest that is a subject of general interest and of value and concern to the public. Unquote. Accordingly, Mr. Depp failed to prove defamation, and his jury's verdict should be set aside. 4. The jury's finding of defamation by implication with respect to the op-ed headline statement is contrary to the law and unsupported by the facts. The jury's verdict with respect to the headline should be set aside because, under applicable law and facts, Ms. Heard neither a. initially made or published, nor b. republished through a tweet the headline statement, quote, I spoke up against sexual violence and faced our culture's wrath. That has to change, unquote, the headline. A. There is no support for the conclusion that Ms. Hurd initially made or published the headline. The newspaper added the headline, and Ms. Hurd played no role in authorizing or, public, or the publication of the headline statement. To establish defamation by implication, Depp must prove the elements for each statement at issue, including, first and foremost, that Ms. Hurd made the headline statement. There is no evidence that Ms. Hurd ever made the headline statement as required for defamation by implication, the newspaper added the headline. The undisputed evidence established that Ms. Hurd never wrote the headline. The newspaper added it without any involvement from Ms. Hurd. Then there's another footnote. Defamation by implication requires the following elements for each statement. 1. The defendants made the statements alleged in the complaint. 2. That the statements even if facially true, were designed and intended by the defendants to imply defamatory implications. 3. That in the light of circumstances prevailing at the time they were made, the statements conveyed that defamatory implication to those who heard or read them. And 4. That the plaintiff suffered harm as a result. Ms. Heard played no role at all with respect to the headline. In fact, Ms. Heard never even became aware of the headline, until Mr. Depp filed a lawsuit against her. Ms. Heard testified she did not even notice it. In fact, there was a completely different headline in the paper edition, which version Ms. Heard had framed. Mr. Depp made no attempt to challenge any of his, this testimony. No reasonable jury could conclude that Ms. Heard made the headline statement giving the evidence. Similarly, no reasonable jury could conclude that Ms. Heard published the headline. To prove publication, it is generally, quote, sufficient to show that when the defendant addressed the defamatory words to the plaintiff, another person was present, heard the words spoken, and understood the statement as referring to the plaintiff, unquote. Then they cite Food Lion, Inc. v. Melton in Virginia, 144 in 1995. 
Here, Ms. Hurd never addressed the headline to the plaintiff. She never wrote or conveyed the headline message to plaintiff and therefore did not publish it in the first instance. Okay, now they're quoting more cases. I'm moving on to B. Ms. Hurd's tweet linking the newspaper article does not constitute republication under applicable law and the facts. Virginia follows the single publication rule under which the mass distribution of defamatory communications, such as Internet posts, are not deemed to be republished each time the communication is reposted or repeated. The public policy supporting the single publication rule and the traditional principles of republication dictate that a mere hyperlink without more cannot constitute republication. Tweeting a link does not constitute republication, even if the tweet includes a mere reference to the article. And they're quoting more cases. Oh my god. Okay. Rather, republication requires one, editing and trans retransmitting the defamatory material, two, redistributing the material with the goal of reaching a new audience, and they're citing Aramo versus Rolling Stone LLC from 2016. Stated differently, republication occurs when the speaker has affirmatively reiterated the statement. Initially, Ms. Hurd never edited or played any role with respect to the headline. Moreover, a brief reference to the linked article does not constitute editing the article. And they're quoting and citing more cases. Mere reference to an article regard, uh, regardless of how favorable it is, as long as it is, does not restate the defamatory material, does not republish the material. Although Ms. Hurd's tweet called attention to the article and indicated she was the author, the tweet did not edit or add content to the article in a matter sufficient to overcome Virginia's single publication rule. Ms. Hurd also never redistributed the headline statement with the goal of reaching a new audience. Retweeting a link to a prominent global newspaper article does not redistribute the material to a new audience as a matter of law. Okay. Uh, the hyperlink served as a reference for the New York Times existing audience and did not direct the old article to a new audience. That is citing... I guess a case called Crosswhite. I am not exactly sure what they're saying here. The 2020 tweet about the 19 article, 2019 article served as a reference for Reuters' existing audience, not a new audience, and third-party tweets at issue did not constitute republication. Okay, so they were citing a case. They're saying, see also Gilmore versus Jones 370 from 2019. Sharing a link on Twitter is not alone enough to make a prima facie showing that West manifested an intent to direct. In short, Ms. Hurd never affirmatively reiterated the headline as required for republication under the law or facts. And then they're stating more cases. Moreover, there is no evidence reasonably supporting a finding that Ms. Hurd republished the headline by tweeting a link to a global newspaper article. Ms. Hurd had no control over whether her link to the newspaper article, include the article included the article's headline. Ms. Hurd never typed the headline in her tweet. She simply linked the article with a short reference that did not restate the headline. Ms. Hurd never even noticed that the headline was contained in the link. She could not have affirmatively reiterated a headline that she did not even notice or type. Accordingly, under applicable law and facts, there is no support for a finding of republication with respect to the headline, and the jury's verdict should be set aside. 5. Mr. Depp did not present evidence of actual malice. Quote, a public figure may not recover damages for a defamatory falsehood without clear and convincing proof that the false statement was made with actual malice. Unquote. To establish actual malice, a plaintiff must demonstrate the defendant realized that his statement was false or that he subjectively entertained serious doubt as to the truth of his statement. That is, uh, quam, that's coming from Jackson v. Hartig from 2007. Courts have a constitutional duty to exercise independent judgment and determine whether the court 
establishes or whether the record establishes actual malice with convincing clarity. Okay. So I skipped past some of the explanation and the other court cases because I want to get to the good stuff. All right. In this case, proving actual malice required showing that at the time the op-ed was published, Ms. Heard did not believe she was abused or that she entertained serious doubt about whether she was abused. Further, because actual malice is a subjective standard, whether Ms. Heard believes she was abused must be judged by her definition of abuse. Ms. Heard testified unequivocally that Mr. Depp abused her physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard does not believe abuse can be physical, emotional, or psychological. Ample undisputed evidence supports Ms. Heard's belief that Mr. Depp abused her. For example, Mr. Depp repeatedly asked Ms. Heard to cut him with a knife and threatened to cut himself in her presence when she refused to comply. Ms. Heard implored Mr. Depp not to cut himself in this recording. This is Defendant's Exhibit 586A they're talking about. Quote, please don't cut your skin. Put the knife down. Unquote. Mr. Depp intimidated Ms. Heard by kicking cabinets and doors, screaming obscenities, and smashing glasses. Defense Exhibit 638. He also destroyed property in her presence and on other occasions. Mr. Depp's testimony that he punched a bathroom sconce that was right by the mirror during an argument at Hicksville. Mr. Depp's testimony that he ripped a phone off a wall in Australia. While fighting with Miss Heard, Mr. Depp pushed over racks of clothes and shoes in her closet and threw her clothes down a staircase. Let's see. Mr. Depp forbid Miss Heard from acting in movies and having meetings. Defense Exhibit 195. Referring to a text message from Mr. Depp to Miss Heard stating, quote, no goddamn meetings, no movies. Why do you deviate from our agreement? Unquote. Mr. Depp texted Ms. Heard, quote, I have other uses for your throat, which do not include injury, unquote. Defense Exhibit 186A. Another footnote, in addition, Mr. Depp and his expert, Dr. Curry, agreed abuse can be verbal and emotional. Mr. Depp repeatedly accused Ms. Heard of infidelity and promiscuity and exhibited jealous and aggressive behavior, including the following. Using paint and his own blood, Mr. Depp wrote Ms. Heard a reminder on Mirror in, a ho in the house where they stayed in Australia, stating, quote, starring Billy Bob and Easy Amber, unquote. Defense Exhibit 374. He left her this, reminding, this reminder directly after she filmed the movie with Billy Bob Thornton. Mr. Depp accused Ms. Heard of having affairs with her co-stars. Mr. Depp's testimony that an argument was about his suspicion that Ms. Heard was having an affair with James Franco. As Mr. Depp told Ms. Heard, quote, I became irrational when you were doing movies. I became jealous and fucking crazy, weird, and you know, we fight a lot more, unquote. Mr. Depp physically intervened when he viewed someone as, quote, very affectionate, unquote, toward Ms. Heard. He testified that in order to protect Ms. Heard's honor, I removed Kelly Sue's hand from Ms. Heard's body and I told her, do not do that. First of all, that is my girl. Second of all, it's rude and aggressive. The question is not whether the jury rejected that the above conduct constitutes abuse as an objective matter. The question is subjective. It is whether Mr. Depp proved that these events did not cause Ms. Heard to believe she was abused. Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard seriously doubted that she was abused and thus failed to prove actual malice. Moreover, while domestic abuse is not limited to physical violence, undisputed evidence also established Mr. Depp participated in physical fights with Ms. Heard and used force. For example, Mr. Depp admitted that in a recording he said, quote, I had butted you in the fucking forehead that doesn't break a nose, unquote. That's Defense Exhibit 587A. While Mr. Depp testified that he did not intentionally headbutt Ms. Heard, it does not follow that Ms. Heard could not have concluded that he intentionally headbutted her. She also could have believed that Mr. Depp headbutting her was abusive, regardless of whether it was intentional. In other words, 
Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard did not believe that this headbutt was physically abusive. In another recording, Mr. Depp stated, quote, I left last night, honestly, I swear to you, because I just couldn't take the idea of more physicality, more physical abuse on each other, unquote. That is the Plaintiff's Exhibit 356. This recording shows at a minimum that Mr. Depp believes the party's conduct could be interpreted as physical abuse of each other, or that he believes Ms. Heard views their conduct as physical abuse of each other. Other conclusions supports Ms. Heard's belief that Mr. Depp physically abused her, and Mr. Depp adduced no evidence to the contrary. Because Mr. Depp presented no evidence that Ms. Heard did not believe he abused her physically, emotionally, and psychologically, he failed to prove actual malice, and the verdict must be set aside. 4. Oh, sorry. 6. My goodness. I think I can't see straight anymore. Mr. Depp did not present insufficient evidence to support a finding of defamation by innuendo. When a plaintiff claims that he is defamed by statements that are literally true because of a false implication arising from them, the implication must be reasonably drawn from the words actually used. And here we go back into court cases. In such cases, the plaintiff may prove defamation through innuendo, quote, an explanation of the allegedly defamatory meaning of the statement if it's not apparent on its face, unquote. The province of the innuendo is to show how the words used are defamatory and how they relate to the plaintiff, but it cannot introduce new matter nor extend the meaning of the words used or make certain which is in fact uncertain. And more cited cases. In this case, the jury's verdict in favor of Mr. Depp should be set aside because he failed to prove through innuendo that the op-ed is about him and it conveys the defamatory implication that he abused Ms. Heard. A. No evidence surrounding the op-ed's publication would reasonably cause a reader to believe the title of the online edition is about Mr. Depp. When a plaintiff proceeds under defamatory by implication theory, proceeds under a defamation by implication theory, he must prove that in light of circumstances prevailing at the time the statements were made, they conveyed a defamatory implication to those who heard or read them. Evidence is, is admissible to show the circumstances surrounding the making and publication of the statement, which would reasonably cause the statement to convey a defamatory meaning to its recipients. During opening statements, counsel for Mr. Depp forecasted that with respect to the title, he would present no evidence of circumstances surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would suggest the title is about Mr. Depp. Counsel stated, After this lawsuit was filed, Ms. Hurd started making up more and more alleged incidents of abuse. And if you'll recall, ladies and gentlemen, the headline of the op-ed references sexual violence. But Ms. Hurd had never made that accusation against Mr. Depp. It was never part of her allegations of abuse. So what changed? What changed between 20, 2016 and 2018? We submit to you, and the evidence will show, when she realized the seriousness of what she had alleged, she panicked, and she alleged sexual assault. In other words, Mr. Depp's theory was that allegations of sexual assault made after the op-ed's publication and after the commencement of the instant action caused readers to understand the title to be about Mr. Depp. This theory finds to support in any authority, and is contrary to Virginia law, which requires a plaintiff to prove that circumstances surrounding a statement's publication caused it to impart a defamatory implication. Consistent with counsel's opening statements at trial, Mr. Depp presented no evidence that prior to or shortly after the op-ed's publication, Ms. Hurd accused him of sexual abuse. The only evidence of prior allegations of sexual abuse was Ms. Hurd's testimony that in the United Kingdom she was provided with confidentiality when testifying about incidents of sexual abuse. She also testified that at the time the op-ed was published, she never publicly accused Mr. Depp of sexual violence. Not only was Ms. Hurd's testimony about sexual abuse in the United Kingdom confidential, no evidence established it was made around the time the op-ed was published. As such, Mr. Depp failed to present evidence of circumstances surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would reasonably cause re readers to believe its title was about him. 
Further, nothing in the op-ed suggests the title is about Mr. Depp. The title states Miss Hurd spoke up against sexual violence, which does not suggest she spoke up about violence by a particular person as opposed to violence in general. The only sexual abuse discussed in the op-ed was Ms. Hurd's statement that she had been harassed and sexually assaulted by the time she was of college age, well, before she met Mr. Depp. The title also has no temporal component suggesting Ms. Hurd spoke up about sexual violence at a particular time, coinciding with Ms. Hurd's separation from Mr. Depp. And the op-ed does not include Mr. Depp's name, because nothing in the op-ed suggests the title is about Mr. Depp, and he presented no evidence of intrinsic circumstances surrounding its publication that would cause the op-ed to be viewed as about him. He failed to prove through innuendo that the title imparts a defamatory implication about him. This is not in the motion, but I disagree with all of this BS. Moving on. B. No evidence established contemporaneous facts surrounding the publication of the op-ed that would reasonably cause a reader to understand any of the statements as conveying a defamatory implication about Mr. Depp. At trial, Mr. Depp's theory of defamation was that the op-ed implied Mr. Depp in abused Ms. Hurd. In, in parentheses, counsel for Mr. Depp asserting in opening statements that the clear implication in Ms. Hurd's op-ed was that she was the victim of domestic abuse perpetrated by Mr. Depp. Mr. Depp maintained that his implication arose from the op-ed because on May 27th of 2016, she obtained a domestic violence restraining order against him. Counsel for Mr. Depp noting in opening statements, Ms. Hurd obtained a restraining order against Mr. Depp on May 27th of 2016. Counsel for Mr. Depp stating in closing arguments that on May 27th of 2016, Ms. Hurd walked into a courthouse in Los Angeles, California to get a no-notice ex parte restraining order against Mr. Depp and in doing so ruined his life. In sum, Mr. Depp argued that circumstances two and a half years before the op-ed's publication in December of 2018 caused it to be defamatory. No court in Virginia, however, has ever permitted circumstances so distant from a publication to serve as innuendo showing the publication conveys a defamatory implication. When, quote, the publication on its face does not show that it applies to the plaintiff, the publication is not actionable, unless the allegations and supporting contemporaneous facts connect the defamatory words to the plaintiff. Statements or publications by the same defendant regarding one specific subject or event made over a relatively short period of time, some of which clearly identify the plaintiff and others which do not, may be considered together for the purpose of establishing that the plaintiff was the person of or concerning whom the alleged defamatory statements were made. Explaining circumstances surrounding or circumstances prevailing at the time of the statements can result in a defamatory implication. Because Mr. Depp presented no evidence that within a relatively short period of time prior to or after the op-ed's publication, Ms. Hurd asserted that he abused her, he failed to prove through innuendo that the op-ed defamed him. C. Mr. Depp cannot recover for statements Ms. Hurd made during prejudicial proceedings, and he failed to prove that any statement in the op-ed implies he abused Ms. Hurd. As explained above, Mr. Depp's theory of the case was that on May 27th of 2016, Ms. Hurd ruined his life by going to a courthouse and obtaining a restraining order against him. Quote, It is settled law in Virginia that words spoken or written in a judicial proceeding that are relevant and pertinent to the matter under inquiry are absolutely privileged. Unquote. In addition, because defamation claims are subject to a one-year statute of limitation, Statements made during the restraining order proceeded are time-barred. Yet Mr. Depp has attempted to bootstrap statements that are protected by judicial immunity and time-barred to the op-ed through a claim of defamation by implication. This attempt failed because only implications that can be, quote, reasonably drawn from the words actually used, unquote, are actionable. Viewed in the light most favorable to Mr. Depp, most evidence could have shown is that if a reader was previously aware of the restraining order, then the statement, quote, two years ago I became a public figure representing domestic abuse, unquote, could remind such a reader that Ms. Hurd obtained a restraining order against Mr. Depp. 
but a reminder of statements made in a judicial proceeding does not amount to republication of those statements. Now they're citing another court case. Judicial privilege may be lost when a statement made in the regular course of judicial proceedings is later republished to another audience outside the proceedings. In other words, reminding readers that Ms. Heard once obtained a restraining order does not, or I'm sorry, does demonstrate that the statements in the op-ed amount to an implied assertion that Mr. Depp abused her. To hold otherwise would treat defamation by implication as a republication doctrine, improperly allow the introduction of new matter, and would permit recovery for the innuendo itself. Innuendo cannot introduce new matter, nor extend the meaning of the words used, nor make that certain which is in fact uncertain. Mr. Depp did use innuendo to show that the op-ed conveys that he abused Miss Hurd. He has attempted to recover for the innuendo itself, Miss Hurd's testimony to obtain a restraining order in a judicial proceeding. Accordingly, the, ver the jury's verdict in favor of Mr. Depp should be set aside. 7. The court should conduct an investigation of juror number 15, whether jury service was proper and due process was protected. The court should investigate whether juror 15 properly served on the jury. On the juror panel list sent to counsel before voir dire, the court noted that the individual who would later be designated juror 15 had a birth year of 1945. Juror 15, however, was clearly born later than 1945. Publicly available information demonstrates that he appeared to have been born in 1970. This discrepancy raises the question whether juror 15 actually received a summons for jury duty and was properly vetted by the court to serve on the jury. And then they go through Virginia Code, which I'm skipping. Thus, the court's, clerk, the court's clerk's office had a statutory obligation to verify the identity of Juror 15. But because Juror 15 was not born in 1945, it appears his identity could not have been verified through any of the means of identification the code provides. And it also raises questions about whether and how Juror 15 could have signed a statement affirming, under penalty of perjury, that he was the named juror if he was 25 years younger than the person the court recognized as Juror 15. Although the, the Virginia Supreme Court has previously construed Virginia Code requiring the jury panel to be made available at least 48 hours before trial, rather than mandatory, it has been observed that adherence to the provisions of the Code is required to the extent necessary to ensure due process. To the extent that the individual who served as Juror 15 was not, in fact, the same individual on the Venari, or that the court clerk's office did not verify his identity, Ms. Hurd's due process was compromised. The Virginia Code does not contemplate jury service by someone not on the Venari for good reason. In any case, but especially a high-profile case such as this one, it is critical to ensure no person who is not on the Venare is able to serve on the jury, whether by inadvertence or intention. Here, the facts show that Juror 15 was decades younger than the individual on the jury panel list, raising questions as to whether they were the same or different people. Ms. Hurd therefore requests that the court investigate whether Juror 15 was properly part of the Venare and whether, prior to jury service, Juror 15 verified his information on the manner in the manner prescribed by Virginia Code. Ms. Hurd further requests this court to take appropriate action based upon the results of the investigation, including, if appropriate, ordering a new trial. Conclusion. Thank God. For all the reasons set forth above, and for the reasons set forth on the record during the hearings and at trial, in the motions in limine, in motions to strike, Ms. Hurd respectfully requests this court to set aside the jury verdict in favor of Mr. Depp and again, Ms. Heard, in its entirety, dismiss the complaint or, in the alternative, order a new trial. Ms. Heard further requests this court to investigate potential improper juror service and take appropriate action warranted by the results of the investigation. Respectfully submitted, Elaine Bredehoft. On July 1st, 2022. And that's it. I'm done. I never thought I'd get to the end of that thing. Oh my god. Okay. Well, and here is the response 
from Johnny Depp's team. It was filed on July 11th, and it is the plaintiff's motion to strike defendant's out-of-time supplemental memorandum in support of her post-trial motions. Plaintiff Johnny C. Depp II, by and through his undersigned counsel, hereby moves this honorable court to strike defendant's supplemental memorandum in support of her post-trial motions, stating as follows. Argument 1. Defendant Hurd's filing is untimely. Pursuant to the court's direction, Ms. Hurd's deadline for submitting her post-trial motions fell on July 1, 2022, one full month after the jury rendered its verdict. It is undisputed that Ms. Hurd did not file her supplemental memorandum until the afternoon of July 8, 2022, one week late, and only fewer than three days before Plaintiff Depp's deadline for submitting his opposition to defendant's post-trial motions due on Monday, July 11, by no later than 10 a.m. True to form, defendant neither notified plaintiff of her forthcoming supplemental memorandum, not sought leave of court for filing it one week out of time. Because Ms. Hurd filed late and without leave of court, the court should grant plaintiff's motion to strike. 2. Ms. Hurd had access to the purported new facts months ago. In her supplemental memorandum, Ms. Hurd does not, because she cannot, make any proffer as to why she, sh she could not have discovered the new facts until now. This is because the clerk's office provided the pre-panel jury list to the parties back on April 6th of 2022, more than two months ago, and five days before the jury was impaneled. In a rare moment of candor, Ms. Hurd admits that she was aware of the purported discrepancy in Juror 15's birth year from the very start of the trial, because, quote, Juror 15 was clearly born later than 1945, unquote. Ms. Hurd therefore concedes she had more than enough time before the trial started and during the six-week trial, but at least two alternatives were available to investigate the dis and discover the alleged new facts. Clearly, Ms. Hurd waived any right to allege new facts she chose not to investigate for so long, much less to demand the extraordinary remedy of a mistrial. 3. Ms. Hurd cites no unfair prejudice. Even if Ms. Hurd had filed her supplemental memorandum in a timely manner, which she did not, and even had she not waived her right to raise this alleged issue by sitting on the information for more than two months, which she did, the court should still grant plaintiff's motion to strike defendant's supplemental memorandum because Ms. Hurd failed to cite any unfair prejudice. Even assuming, assuming arguendo, Ms. Hurd's latest thesis, i.e., that a son served instead of his father, there would be no prejudice as Juror 15 was qualified to serve as a juror in Fairfax County and was vetted by the court and the party's counsel, just as all of the other jurors were. Conclusion Based on the foregoing, the court should grant plaintiff's motion and strike defendant's supplemental memorandum, dated July 11, 2022. And we have a little footnote that I'm going to read here. Defendant seems to have abandoned her prior baseless assertions, made both by Ms. Hurd and her counsel on national television, that the jurors violated their oaths by watching social media during the trial, which in turn influenced their verdicts. Disgraceful that Ms. Hurd made such scandalous allegations, and disappointing that no apology and recantation followed. Wow. Excellent response. I wonder if Amber would have had the same problem with the juror and wanted him investigated if the verdict had gone her way. Huh? Hmm. Anyway, on to the judge's order that was released and, well, filed and released today on July 13th of 2022. And here we go. This cause came before the court upon defendant Amber Laura Hurd's post-trial motions. After review of defendant's post-trial motions, plaintiff's opposition, and the relevant statutes and case law, it is therefore ordered as follows. Defendant Amber Laura Hurd's post-trial motions 1 through 6 are denied for the reasons stated on the record. 
Defendant Amber Laura Hurd's post-trial motion, 7, is likewise denied, for the reasons outlined below. The purpose of voir dire is to obtain a fair and impartial jury. Voir dire is necessary to ascertain whether any juror has an interest in the case or any bias or prejudice in relation to it, and that he in fact stands indifferent in the cause. The summons issued to Juror 15 listed his legal name and address, and no birth date was noted. The court has pulled Juror 15's jury questionnaire, attached, and redacted. Juror 15 completed the jury questionnaire as himself, filling in his proper birth date. The information presented on the jury questionnaire matches the information Juror 15 provided to the court. Juror 15 was vetted by the court on the record and met the statutory requirements for service. The parties also questioned the jury panel for a full day and informed the court that the jury panel was acceptable. Therefore, due process was guaranteed and provided to all parties in this litigation. Voir dire was conducted in a fair and impartial manner, with the court and both parties examining the potential jurors. There is no evidence of fraud or wrongdoing. Further, the defendant was provided the jury list five days prior to the commencement of trial and knew or should have known about the mistake at any time during the seven-week pendency of this trial. She had every opportunity to object to or voir dire on the issue. Parties generally must make objections at the time a ruling or order is made to put the court on notice that an issue is meant to be preserved. Quote, any error in the information shown on such copy of the jury panel shall not be grounds for a mistrial or assignable as error on appeal, and the parties in the case shall be responsible for verifying the accuracy of such information. Unquote. In parentheses, emphasis added. Consequently, defendant, as well as plaintiff, had an affirmative obligation to ensure the accuracy of the information provided for the jury panel. A party cannot wait until receiving an adverse verdict to object for the first time on an issue known since the beginning of trial. The issue has been waived. Even if, arguendo, the objection has not been waived, Objections to any alleged discrepancies in jury lists and any legal disabilities of potential jurors must be made in accordance with Virginia Code, Section 8.01-352. That section provides in relevant part, quote, Unless objection to such irregularity or disability is made pursuant to subsection A herein, and unless it appears that the irregularity was intentional, or that the irregularity or disability be such as probable cause injustice in a civil case to the party making the hold on I gotta go to the next page here making the objection then such irregularity or disability shall not be cause for summoning a new panel or juror or for setting aside a verdict or granting a new trial unquote Furthermore, while parties must make this objection while following the above procedure, the party moving under this code section must provide some evidence of prejudice. Defendant has neither followed the proper procedure nor shown evidence of prejudice. Defendant does not allege Juror 15's inclusion on the jury prejudice turn in any way. The juror was vetted, sat for the entire jury, deliberated, and reached a verdict. The only evidence before this court is that this juror and all jurors followed their oaths, the court's instructions, and orders. This court is bound by the competent decision of the jury. Entered this 13th day of July, 2022, by the Honorable Penny S. Escaret. It says this order is final. And there you have it. So... Amber was mad. She didn't win. So she tried to do whatever she could, huh, to get uh, this thrown out. And it's not going anywhere because the judge said, nice try. And I'm really loving the response from Johnny Depp's team. It was quite, I don't know, stabbing in the back a little bit there. But uh, 
yeah, I wanted to read it all. I didn't read it because I just didn't sit down and do it. I heard a lot about it, but I just wanted to read it for myself, and now we all know. So I hope you're all still awake, or I guess if you listen to this to help put you to sleep, that's fine too. But I want to thank you all for listening, and uh, now we all are caught up. We know exactly what's going on, and, uh, you know, I wish Johnny Depp the best. I really do. The guy's been through hell, so... I really hope uh, Amber moves on and somehow fixes herself and her life. And Johnny Depp just gets the best of everything because he deserves it. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate it. I know I took up a lot of your time, but you guys are the best. And I'll see you on my next video.